Hi, everyone. Welcome to Mountain Travel Symposium's Recovery Road webinar series. This is the third webinar in our Recovery Road series, and today we're sitting down with lodging properties. So for those of you who have been here before, uh, I probably don't need an introduction, but uh, for those who are new, I'm Kat Shaw, the Director of Marketing and Content for MTS, and I will be your host today. Before we get started, I want to go over a couple of webinar features. We will have a Q&A with all of our speakers at the end of the webinar, so please submit any questions you have for our panelists via the Q&A feature. Uh, there's also a chat feature. Please try and keep all of your questions in the Q&A because that's what we'll be monitoring. There's also a survey that will pop up at the end of the webinar. And we really, really appreciate all of your feedback. It helps us create content for future webinars and uh, improve our educational programming. So please do take a few minutes to fill that out at the end of the webinar. And so, like I said, this is the third webinar in our Recovery Road series. And we're sitting down with some lodging partners today. <clears throat> We'll be joined with uh, Ben Day, Director of Sales and Marketing, Blackcomb Springs and S Spring Suites, Ryan Road Armor, the Director of Market Management for Expedia Group, Lance Syret, the General Manager at Ruby's Inn Inc., and Bettina Zinner, the General Manager for Wengen Classic Hotels. So we're really excited to have everybody here today. And I'm going to have Ryan uh, come and join me. Lovely. Can you see me and can you hear me? Yeah, we are all set, Ryan. So the, the joys of virtual meetings. <laughs> yeah. So can you start off by uh, telling the MTS audience a little bit about your role? And uh, you know, you're you're here with Expedia, not a lodging partner. So telling us a, a little bit. Um, about yourself and why you're here today. Yeah, perfect. So my name is Ryan and I'm the Director of Market Management for the Mountain Region here uh, at Expedia Group. So I've been with Expedia for about six years in various roles and currently residing here in Colorado. And prior to joining Expedia, I worked for one of the main uh, ski resort operators in North America. So like mentioned, I'm not a lodging partner, but we support many lodging partners. And, and my goal here today is to hopefully share some trends, talk a little bit about what we're seeing in the industry, and I'm really excited to be on this panel with everyone. So thanks for having me. Great. Well, we're excited you're here, too. Um, so like you said, you guys, uh, you're going to be sharing some trends. So why don't we kick it off with what, what are some of the trends that you're seeing as far as, um, you know, hotel bookings are going, especially in, you know, mountain destinations? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Let's jump right in. Um, so we're seeing positive week over week uh, search interest for travelers in all of the mountain areas represented on the panel today. Uh, so to go into a couple examples, in the month of July, we saw travelers searching for trips in August increase by more than 35% week over week in Bryce Canyon, Whistler, and Bengen. So to take that example a little bit further, searches in that same period. So these are searches in the month of July for trips in September, that was pacing north of 25% week over week. So what we're seeing really is there's still a lot of pent up demand for summer travel and the search data in our platform is definitely an indicator of that as well. But I know everyone on this call, everyone dialed in, we live and operate in mountain destinations. So it wouldn't be a proper mountain call without talking about winter. And we are starting to see some early signs of winter travel as well. So travelers searching in the month of July for trips in January uh, is pacing nearly 25% week over week. So really wh why are we talking about this? Why am I talking about it? And we think it's really important for hoteliers to know where their demand is coming from as we navigate through these uncertain times. So, for example, in Bryce Canyon and Whistler, the majority of the searches for trips in those areas are coming from domestic travelers. But if we pivot and we look at Bengen, nearly 20% of the, search, the searches in that area are coming from American travelers. So whether your demand is coming domestically or internationally, you know, that's the first question to answer. But if you do have international uh, travel coming into your market, it's really, really important to know sort of the tolerance of non-essential travel from those countries, any sort of, you know, uh, rules and regulations. And this will really allow strategies to make sense and you can target the right customer at the right time as a result. 
That's that's really informative and uh, really great great numbers to to hear about. So yeah, you, everyone jotted those down. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned um, about where travelers would, are are coming from. Do you have any other um, insights or information onto uh, you know other demographics of those those travelers and what they're searching? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think the best way to probably answer this question is through a study that we've recently conducted. So we conducted a study with the group BDRC, and the results of this study showed that nearly half of Americans are interested in destinations either in mountains or to a lake. And while there's probably a myriad of different reasons of why, we really feel like this is likely due to the remoteness of these destinations, these open air spaces, outdoor recreation in these spaces, and really the potential ease to socially distance responsibly in, in these areas is sort of where we're seeing this demand come. Um, personally, from my perspective, I'm curious to hear uh, what the other partners and hoteliers on this uh, call have to say, because we know there's some uniqueness to the different areas, but um, yeah, that's what we're seeing so far. And so are there any, are there any different things or things that are kind of out of the ordinary about booking behavior? Maybe, you know, it's, it, it, it's a lot, you know, earlier uh, or closer to, excuse me, you, you know, time of travel or anything that's, that's different there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I wish I had a, a crystal ball to, to tell all of the ins and outs of what we should expect over the next few months. Um, and as far as anticipating longer or shorter, um, you know, roads to recovery and things like that, I can't specifically speak, but what we are seeing and mentioning that study again is the access to outdoors and these less populated destinations and less populated activities uh, are really what's, what's fueling some of uh, the search interests that we're seeing. And, you know, the remote, remoteness of these destinations, potential ease of social distance responsibly is something that we're seeing as well. You know, as far as like what makes the mountain region unique, I would say, you know, I'll, I'll share a little personal anecdote. So my wife and I, we live in Colorado and we're huge skiers and somehow it became August. I don't know how, but it is. And uh, we've been joking that we already wear masks when we go skiing. And uh, as we're starting to dream of upcoming ski trips, we've been joking that hopefully the mask culture that exists uh, will you know, translate into successful openings for all of our ski destinations. So obviously we're here with um, some, some partners today and, and you've shared some, some great stats and data. What is Expedia doing to you know, work with partners on their recovery plans and process? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to ask this question. You know, travel and tourism, it really plays a critical role in reinvigorating the global economy. And this will lay the foundation for a long-term recovery as well. You know, I believe we all have a key role in helping spur some of this industry recovery, and it's, it's going to take collaboration, it's going to take partnership, and really a unified approach across all parties. But where we've been focusing at Expedia Group is making sure that we're providing support to partners of all sizes in the travel ecosystem. And we're doing this by offering tools and resources to help partners navigate these unprecedented times. So what this looks like for us is we've rolled out a series of global initiatives to support our travel partners. And, you know, this includes industry-wide programs, destination rebound, partner level relief. You know, I'm in the camp that there's not a one-size-fits-all approach to recovery and each partner, each destination, they're going to have their own uniqueness as they, as they navigate these future months. But our goal at Expedia Group is making sure that we're creating scalable programs and tools that can fit each partner need as, you know, they navigate their own individual uh, recovery plans. So how that, I mean, that sounds like an incredible um, program that, you know, a lot of our MTS audience can take advantage of. How uh, is the program working so far? Have you, you know, seen it in action? Yeah, yeah. Um, so to give a little bit of uh, further detail, our recovery program kicked off in May of 2020 and is currently live across uh, hundreds of markets around the world. And overall, the, the sentiment from partners has been uh, largely positive and positive in two main buckets. Uh, the first bucket is they appreciate the partnership and collaboration on their own unique recovery paths. And, you know, the second is they recognize the support we're providing is hopefully going to make a difference in both the short term and the long term. You know, I would say one, one quick blurb as well is we know that data is really important right now. And we've been hearing from lodging partners through various conversations that we have is the importance of data. And so we've made some of this data available, some of this proprietary data available through our market insights tool. And this is a tool that all uh, Expedia Group uh, partners have access to. And it really shows some of this demand trend that we we're talking about. So consumer behaviors, consumer insights, demand trends, things like that at both the market and a sub-market level. 
you know, I think lastly, it's probably uh, important to note that it's a fluid environment right now. And we're currently and fully aware of all the current restrictions, but we know things can change. So we're making sure that we're in tune with that. And all of the, you know, the programs and the tools that we're providing are making sure that all the partners can have a maximum impact in their own recovery plans as well as we work through it together. So you mentioned that data is super important and obviously you've got a lot of data points um, at Expedia. If hoteliers were to, to look at just one data point, what do you think is uh, you know, the best, best kind of gauge in this current landscape? Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, referencing some of the earlier points, it's, it's really important right now to know where your demand is coming from and making sure that you're targeting the right customer at the right time. Um, so we know there's a lot of restrictions in place, travel bans, uh, quarantine laws and things like that, and really making sure that you're fully in tune with the tolerance of the customers coming into your marketplace or coming into your hotel is important. And being um, ready to change your strategy or have a plan B uh, when, when things change as we, you know, look forward. Good. Uh, all right. Well, we are at about time. So I'm going to say goodbye to you now, Ryan, and um, we'll, we'll see you back at, at the end for our Q&A. So um, with that, I'd like to invite Lance Syrett to join me. Hi. Lance. Going, yeah. Good. Good. Good morning. So you're joining us from Utah. Yeah, beautiful Bryce Canyon City, which is right on the doorstep to beautiful Bryce Canyon National Park. But you know, uh, it's more plateaus in southern Utah. We don't have those steep mountains like uh, Park City and the Wasatch Front. But you no, know, we're at uh, almost 8,000 feet, so we get our snow down here. It's just flat. <laughs> so, so can you tell our audience a little bit about uh, your properties and kind of what you went through and as far as, you know, from back in March to, to now and, and what you're seeing. So we have a, a little bit of an understanding of, of what you went through and, and where you currently are. And absolutely. Well, we are a uh, three season, mostly summer destination uh, here at the resort. You know, we've been here for 104 years. We've actually got three different uh, individual hotels. Uh, All together, it adds up to about 700 hotel rooms. We've got an RV park, campground, uh, activities, uh, you know, restaurants, uh, we, we've got a lot going on here. So uh, normally, uh, you know, uh, those of you in the tourist business, they know, you, you know, it's just like farming. So you got to make money when the sun's shining or when the snow's there. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we started off uh, with COVID, you know, it was right at the end of the winter. And that's the thing is winter, we don't have a lot of positive cash flow, but we got a lot of people, a lot of staff that is, is on year round. So COVID really hit us at the worst possible time as far as our cash, because there's kind of a magic day there in the spring where we start from going having a negative cash flow to having a positive cash flow. And that took a lot longer to get. And, uh, you know, we're just not getting enough hay in the barn. Uh, just to kind of give you some statistics. We, uh, you know, we're operating at about 45% uh, capacity right now, which again, that uh, normally this time of year would be hundred percent every single night. Plus, uh, you know, the rate is about 40% of where we should be. So kind of this vicious cycle, you know, supply and demand. And when it works in your favor, it's a great thing when you're a hotelier, when you're in a vicious spiral, it's, it's pretty bad. So, you know, there may be some people on the line who think 45% uh, capacity is a fabulous thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, trust me, I, I count my blessings every night. And I, you know, I was on another webinar uh, recently and I said, hey, if I could go back in time and tell my April self, say, hey, would you go to the levels you're now in August? I would be grateful to have these, these levels, and I still am. Yeah, I wish we could go back to the, you know, last year, but yeah, I'm grateful for what we got. Yeah. So what are you, what did you do as far as some of your, um, you know, recovery strategies, be it marketing or sales um, or partnerships? To, to get to where you are now or, or to, you know, continue on that uh, upward progress of increasing the occupancy? Well, uh, you don't get to have 700 rooms without a lot of partners. You know, historically, uh, the national parks in general have been very popular with the international crowd. And uh, I, I remember the first meeting uh, when COVID kind of hit was a meeting where we were talking about, it was when the uh, European flights were gonna be suspended for 30 days, that was during April. And uh, we met and we talked about, uh, okay, 
how are we going to backfill this business when we're not going to have any international business for 30 days when normally that's 60% of our business that month. And, uh, of course we, we talked and we came up with some strategies and, uh, and most of those strategies are still in place as far as uh, uh, drive market. You know, historically we haven't, uh, again, when you're hundred percent every night during the summer, uh, you strategically uh, advertise, you don't have to advertise to the masses because you're already full, but uh, we've won out, uh, you know, states around us, Colorado, uh, Arizona, uh, Nevada. Uh, and we've, uh, you know, we've just kind of uh, followed the market. It's this like big amoeba that, you know, everything keeps changing. And that was one of the things that I kept telling people too, is, you know, we make a decision one week in, uh, one week in um, April, like for example, okay, when they canceled the flights, we had a marketing strategy, which we enacted for, a week or two and then everything changed again and then uh, we had to do something different then everything changed again we had to do something different and uh, the thing that uh, you kind of had to remind yourself was just because you made that decision uh, last week and it's no longer relevant doesn't mean it was a bad decision and that and that's one thing that COVID has taught me that maybe uh, you know that short-term decisions just because you change your mind in two weeks doesn't mean that that was a bad decision. So that's one of the things that uh, COVID has really taught us to get used to. As far as partners, it's been really uh, good to work with uh, our partners. You know, I know we've got uh, Kyle here from Expedia and uh, he's, uh, excuse me, Ryan. <laughs> so we got Ryan from Expedia on here and uh, you know, we've taken advantage of like the, uh, you know, the Expedia, the Revive and Relief program, uh, that's been great. You know, we did, uh, you know, with COVID, we've been able to dive more than ever into our data and to understand our customers and understand uh, their behavior. And, uh, you know, Expedia, you know, the other OTAs have been great partners. Uh, we've never utilized their, uh, their data suites like we have this year. You know, uh, some of our uh, highlights that I've discovered is, you know, this year, uh, I, I just happened to print out some of these, but like for example, same day bookings last year were the same period. We'd get same day bookings was about 4% of our total bookings uh, through a partner like Expedia. This year is 23%. Just shows that the customers are waiting until last minute to make decisions. And uh, you know, just length of stay data. Last year, you know, 80% of our customers stay only one night because a lot of our customers are coming through and they're seeing multiple national parks and they're doing these aggressive itineraries. This year, uh, that's reduced, you know, to 59%. Our, our two night bookings have doubled, our three night bookings have tripled. So just, you know, behaviors like that, it's invaluable when you're, when you, when every dollar counts right now, you know, when the money's flowing, uh, maybe some of these uh, things aren't as important, uh, but when the money's not, uh, you really have to do things with a scalpel. You know, I, you just said so many um, in incredible things there for our audience to to understand. I think it's it's first of all, I loved what you said about you know not uh, understanding that just because you made a decision that was changed doesn't mean that it was a wrong decision. I, I know that for our team at, at M MTS, that was uh, definitely holds true. Um, but you know about how your length of stay is increased and, and the booking window is a lot shorter. How does having that information and being equipped with that data help you plan better as far as, you know, staffing goes or um, saying turnover of, of rooms and, and whatnot? Why is it really powerful for you, for you to have that information? Well, uh, you hit around the head as far as uh, staffing, you know, uh, I've got a kitchen manager who he's uh, extremely OCD and uh, he's been here for several years. And, and normally our season is basically like a farmer's almanac. Very easy to predict, you know, the, the, the dips and the valleys and the, the amount of uh, knowing who's, who's going to be traveling, what demographic, you know, August, you know, August is always heavy with Italians. Well, you got to load up on the steaks because those Italian river steaks, you know, little things like that, that under normal year, you know, are very easy to plan, you know, two or three months out for staffing and things like that. So, so having, again, this data that shows, okay, just because you're planning on staffing now based on that number, you know, if you, you look at these factors and you can kind of, uh, you know, project what the bookings are going to be, even though that's not what you're used to seeing. So you just have to get to the new, the new kind of used to the new, the temporary normal. I refuse to say the new normal, the temporary normal. Uh, it's, it's invaluable to have your data right now. 
So you've, you've talked a lot about how you've changed up your strategy and um, ha had to be you know, able to pivot. And you maybe are using information that you, that you had before, but you weren't, um, you know, you had access to, but you weren't utilizing. Is there anything that you've implemented during this time period or, um, you know, any sort of information that you're looking at during this time period that you're definitely going to continue to look at even in the future as things, uh, you know, return to normal and get better? Oh, absolutely. You know, uh, you know, I, I'm, I've been doing this long enough that, you know, I remember when the OTAs was, uh, everything was extra nets and everything. there was no, uh, no distribution wasn't a thing. And, uh, I'll tell you what, uh, I've come full circle, you know, even though they get my money and, uh, you know, that's money well spent. I look at that as an advertising spend. So a little shout out to people like Expedia on here that, uh, you know, and, and I'll be honest with you, companies like Expedia have done a great job of, uh, of showing that they are a partner in the last four or five years. It used to be they were these nameless, faceless companies that called you up when they were out of, when you were out of parody and that's all you ever heard from them. So, but anyway, but uh, good partners right now. Hey man, it's, it's better to have friends and enemies. That's for sure. And uh, if anybody wants to sell a hotel room, I don't care. They, they can sell it for me. So. Good. Yeah. I, I think we are all feeling that, uh, you know, the, the banding together of the entire travel industry, various sectors um, is, you know, super, super important. So. <clears throat> um. All right, so I uh, am gonna gonna say goodbye to you, Lance, as well, and um, we are going to move across the uh, the uh, water and say hello to Bettina Zinnert from Switzerland. Hello, everybody. Here's Bettina from Wagen in Switzerland. I hope everyone can see and hear me. Yes, you are good. And I have to apologize to the audience. Bettina had, has a wonderful mountainous backdrop, but the lighting wasn't good and we weren't able to see her face. So I, I made her move. So. <laughs> no problem at all. I mean, you can look up pictures in the internet. That's, that's all fine. So Bettina, uh, tell us a little bit about um, you know, your properties and, um, and, and what you've seen over the past couple of months and what you're experiencing now. So um, I'm based in Wengen and I'm um, the general manager of our three family owned hotels. It's um, one three star hotel and two four star hotel with a total of around 360 beds. And I do also have some self catering apartments that we rent out. So basically what happened mid-March, as everyone experienced that, that complete lockdown came, the people left immediately. And so we basically ended this skiing season for us a month earlier than expected. So with no guests and no ski lifts running, we uh, decided to close the hotels. We were a bit lucky on our side because we are usually having between the winter season and summer season anyway the hotels close when we do renovations and things like that so that was basically in the middle of the lockdown and then when we saw that restrictions lowered a little bit of traveling especially here in switzerland we could then start the summer season uh months later like mid uh, mid june but what I did, I didn't open all hotels at once. So I basically tried to gather everything a little bit together and started with one hotel. And then I could go when the holiday season started here in Switzerland that we could open another hotel and run, run it basically. Yeah. And so what do your occupancy levels look like now? So at the moment, like it's very, very related to the domestic market. And so that the, since Switzerland is pretty small and you can reach from everywhere in Switzerland, Wengen in about three to four hours, the people, they just wait and see how the weather is. And if we have a nice weekend and it's sunny, we have easy, like we get hundred percent or like last weekend we were fully booked. But as soon as the the weather is bad uh, the people don't book they just wait and then we're we're around like 10 10 to 20 percent and also the international markets are are missing at the moment and we are very international here in Wengen especially with the US market for example we have an occupancy of 25 percent usually in summer and this went down to zero so 
it's all very, very short term. Like I would say the big booking window is not more than five days ahead of the arrival date. And so this makes it a little bit difficult to plan. And, and it's very dynamic from being booked out to have just 10% of customers. So we have to stay very flexible at the moment. So you mentioned that weather is a, a key indicator of uh, your success. What are some other data points or, or you know, pieces of information that you're looking at to predict what your um, you know, occupancy levels are going to be like? I mean, especially important is also the restrictions that on, other country has of tra on traveling. Like if they have to go back to quarantine, um, of course, these markets are not coming. Since Switzerland has pretty low numbers, we see some demand from international markets, but the demand is there, but they're really also wait to the last minute if they really book and have a flight and if they can be sure not to have to quarantine. Since numbers here in Switzerland are very low, we have nearly no other countries that put the guests that are arriving here into quarantine when they come back. So this is very positive for us. So I look especially, Switzerland tourism has like a spreadsheet where they always um, put, the, put the data in uh, about the restrictions of the other countries, if they're allowed to enter Switzerland, what are the rules, and that's what we concentrate on to make our decisions with which markets we are going to focus. And, uh, you know, that those are all great resources. What are some of the partners that you're working with, be it, you know, uh, um, the, the DMO, airlines, um, you know, OTAs, and, and, and what are those partnerships like? So with the DMO, they especially, they, they look at the traffic from, from the, the traffic on the website, and they also provide us with this data where we can see where the demand is increasing. And especially the OTAs, of course, they have, like Expedia, for example, they have, they have, um, they can see, they have a lot of data and there, there we can see which markets, where the demand increases. Like, for example, the US is, is there a little bit, but I think they also look a little bit and looking forward to come and travel again, but they don't book yet. But uh, so we can see from this data which markets are demanding at the moment the most. And what we can see, it's very, very domestic. We maybe see a little bit from Germany, from the Netherlands, that where it picked up a little bit, and also the UK. But if it goes further to Asia or the States, it's still pretty low at the moment. Mm -hmm. So have you changed any of your um, messaging, especially since you're targeting, you know, mostly domestic travelers um, to, you know, reassure people that your properties are, are safe and, and open and you're, you know, ready to welcome visitors? As I mean, what I think is very, very important that, that you're staying very flexible with your cancellation policies. This is something that the people especially look now until what date of arrival can I cancel my booking. So I really recommend to stay very flexible with all partners that you allow to, to do rebookings uh, until date of arrival that you have maybe two to five days cancellation free of charge fully. Um, also look, especially when it comes to international travel, well, where the bookings are further out, that you kind of put a clause into your contract that if, for example, there are some government restrictions on or they cannot uh, enter the country, that you give them, um, that they can cancel free of charge or rebook without any charges. I think this is very important at the moment. That's what the people look at, especially at the, what I see. Mm -hmm. And do you think flexible cancellation policies like that are something that are going to stay after the pandemic and be, you know, a little bit more customer and traveler friendly? I think it will change. I mean, you need to see how it works best how you can plan with your stuff if you're flexible yourself. I mean, I would never go to a zero cancellation policy because right. you need to plan a little bit ahead. So I think with five days, I think I'm able to, 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 to 
organize everything with the staff and so on. And I think we, if it's not the absolute peak season, we're going to stay with this policy further out. We also had it before because with the international travel and when they travel around Switzerland, people want to stay flexible. So you have to give that to the, to the customers to so get booked. We, uh, we didn't talk with Lance about this, but what are some of the new hygiene practices you've put into um, place at your property? So from the Swiss government, we have, um, we have a whole document how to implement these um, restrictions that we have, the hygienic standards. So for example, when you uh, enter the property, you have everywhere when you go to the dining room or the spa, you have disinfectants. Uh, it's rules that you have to keep distance of uh, one and a half meters from each other. Or for example, there's only the same people from the same room allowed to be in, in the elevator. It's things that we have written everywhere. And also like we collect all the data just in case something happens we can contact the people so we have to get email addresses and phone numbers from all the clients that in case something happens that we can contact them and these are rules that our government put in place and of course we we do um have have them yeah yeah that's that's great to have the government uh guidance there and that's very helpful so I've um, got one more question left for you, and that, that's going to be, what would, would be your biggest um, takeaway or learning, or what was the biggest opportunity that, that came out of this for, for your business? I mean, of course, you, you always get a little bit new ideas. And for example, one thing was that like, for example, business travel decreased nearly to zero here in Switzerland, but we have loads of people who are staying in their home office currently that until the end of the year and what i did like with our uh, meeting room that we usually use for for business meetings i turned that into a co-working space now so i'm 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 giving co like people who are staying in our hotel they um can get their um, home office in the mountains so they get the free a free table and with everything like princess and so on that they can work from the hotel so they they don't have to stay at home the whole time and can have their office in the in the mountains that's for example something and of course the whole flexibility and that you have to adapt that to the situation of course is important and also to to talk with the employees and, and, and tell them how, like you have to communicate and tell them how the situation is and give them some security about their job. And these are things that I took out. It's very important to talk to the people how the situation is. I, I think you just gave a fabulous example of, uh, you know, creativity and ingenuity to our audience about that uh, workspace. That's, fabulous way to use space that was not being utilized uh, in this situation. So um, thank you so much for that takeaway for our group. So uh, we are gonna say goodbye to you and we'll welcome you back for our Q&A. Thank you so much, Bettina. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. And uh, so next up we've got Ben Day and he is joining us from Whistler. Welcome, Ben. Thanks, Kat. Great to be here. And, uh... Hopefully everyone is enjoying uh, the information so far. I've certainly got some takeaways in my notebook now from, uh, from the other, other panelists. Good, great. So why don't you let our audience know, um, you know what your, your property is up to in uh, Whistler currently and, and through the past couple of months? Well, uh, we, uh, we're a new management company uh, at the hotel here. We're right on the, the slopes of Blackcomb Mountain with a, a great location. We opened, uh, we opened on December 15th, uh, closed on March 23rd, and then reopened on June the 1st. So it's a little bit of a roller coaster ride these, uh, these past six months and uh, lots, and, lots and lots of learn. In British Columbia, we've had a lot of um, advice from our provincial health officer, Dr. Bonnie Henry, who has been an absolute uh, fa fabulous leader. Um, lots of advice and advisories as opposed to regulations. Um, we have a few like, you can't have more than 50 people together in any scenario, uh, the two meter distancing rule. 
Um, but really it's been advisory driven and on June 23rd, the uh, non-essential travel uh, restriction was lifted or advice. And so that's when we really started to see occupancy pick up. Uh, June was extremely slow and then uh, July has, uh, has been very strong um, as the, the local skiers, or sorry, the local uh, summer travelers in Vancouver um, don't really have anywhere else to go. They're used to going to uh, Las Vegas and Europe and all over the place. Um, and uh, so they've really come come to see Whistler as an option to get out of out of the city and uh, get away for a few days. So how have you tried to capitalize on that local market and, and maybe the way that you changed your messaging or perhaps worked differently with um, you know, your partners? We certainly uh, lent very heavily on our, um, on our partners, uh, Expedia. Uh, we have a great rep in Vancouver, Kevin. Um, and uh, most of the staff, myself included, were, were laid off for about six weeks when we closed. Um, and so it was great to have some resources from the partners who had actually been able to keep a, a finger on the pulse. Um, so uh, as some of the other panelists said, really leaning on those people to find out who was looking, where they were, what sort of length of stay. Um, we're part of a small chain and our, our president, Jim, um, uh, was a strong leader with uh, length of stay offers. The, the local markets in, in BC think of Whistler as a one or two night getaway at the weekends and that, that doesn't really fit the, the, the distancing model and, and the space and also the, the, the revenue model. So we, we went out very aggressively with a length of stay offers, third night free, and we've seen a lot of success with that and, and then layering on top of that, trying to get people to come midweek and say, the resort's less busy, there will be fewer lineups, it's easier to get out into the fresh air, there's more room by the pool, and then really you know, encouraging people to actually try and change their, their habits a little bit, but also remembering that you know, we've got a very small local market. Yeah, that's a great strategy, you know, playing on, on those, those strengths of uh, midweek, and especially because people are a little bit more flexible with working from home and, yeah. and, and all of that. So um, what, are, what are some of the key data points that you're looking at um, to you know, make your decisions on, on staffing and um, uh, you know, operations? Well, I think uh, Lance and, uh, and Bettina had uh, some great, great insights already uh, and we look at lots of data. We can get too, too head down in spreadsheets sometimes um, we certainly uh, look at that. Um, Lance talked about people arriving same day. I do, you know, that spurred me to look at my spreadsheet and 57% um, of our bookings last week were within arrival within seven days. Um, that makes it hard for the, uh, the housekeeping uh, manager to, to put that schedule out two weeks ahead of time. Um, so we're really looking at that. But also uh, uh, Bettina made a great point about the weather. Um, it's going to be 27 degrees and uh, centigrade and sunny in, a, in American money that's about what 80 84 degrees and um, you know the soft the soft information is probably just as useful as, as all those data points um, tourism Whistler is a is an organization that we all buy into as resort partners and they publish some really really good stats and they hold a, a bi-weekly uh, accommodation managers meeting and share information so we, we you know we listen to all sorts of all sorts of ideas and, and we also found, I also found talking to our own associates and team members has been really useful to understand what, what the demands are, what the requests are. Um, and that's changed our marketing a little bit. Um, as, as we reopened, um, we got the go ahead to open our swimming pool and hot tubs with limited access uh, and social distancing. And that's been a huge win because all of the swimming pools that are the sort of government run have all been closed. So uh, that was a big driver for us. And that's helped us, you know, spend our marketing dollars on pictures of, of families by the pool. Yeah, that's really great. And, and again, capitalizing on, you know, what's uh, currently happening in, in the market. So with all of that, that, that you just mentioned, what you've been learning, you know, about 
traveler habits and um, what's happening, you know, with the, what the locals want. How is all of that informing your planning for the winter season, which is, you know, <laughs> on us? Well, uh, that certainly, uh, you know, can can wake me up in the in the middle of the night sometimes. Um, like a, a lot Some of ski can't even get to sleep. So at least you're getting to sleep. <laughs> a lot of ski resort properties uh, see see big revenues in the winter time, and we're no exception in Whistler. And um, our advance interest has been very very small. Um, the uh, 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 the, the Expedia gentleman earlier um, was, uh, Ryan was talking about uh, uh, a little bit of winter interest, you know, and so that's, that's really informing me of, of where we should be going. Uh, I think our partners may sometimes see those, those green shoots of recovery in, in the winter market before we do. So we'll, we'll start to pivot and look at our, our winter marketing a little more closely. And then, um, yeah, winter's going to be extremely scary, and uh, we don't know whether our, our market is going to be just British Columbia or down into the States or any anybody who gets on a plane. So we're, we're going to have to be extremely flexible this winter. Yeah, I think that, that we've all learned that. And if we weren't flexible before, we have certainly, um, you know, learned how to uh, flex that, that muscle because yeah. you really can't survive you know, without being able to, to pivot uh, so quickly. So, um, well, I've got one last question for you as well, and that is uh, going to be the same as Bettina. You know, what has been your um, uh, biggest opportunity that you found or, um, you know, what have you learned throughout this whole experience that has been the most valuable to you? Um. I think uh, Lance put it well uh, about, you know, having to be a little bit forgiving. Um, at the end of the day, we, we work in just the most amazing industry. Um, we get to be in some of the most beautiful places in the world. And we need to remember that, that perhaps travel and hospitality is not life and death. And we need to uh, remember that and for, be a little more forgiving um, and, uh, and, you know, and learn to enjoy our, our guests that we do have. Um, and remember that everyone comes with a, a different set of uh, uh, anxieties and, and perceptions um, and trying to be sensitive. Our, once again, our health officer has constantly reminded us all in British Columbia every day to be, to be kind, um, to be kind to each other because there are, you know, it's a stressful time and, and that certainly goes a long way to, to, to working with our team members and our, and our guests. Great. Uh, and I, I think that it's definitely something that a lot of us have, have learned to just, you know, be more open-minded and understanding of, of all of, all of the people that we work with and that we come in contact with. So thanks so much for your insights, Ben. Um, you. I'm going to welcome Ryan and Bettina, uh, back on stage <laughs> and, uh, we'll get our Q and A kicked off. So. Thanks for uh, coming back, you guys. Um, so we've already got a couple of questions submitted, so I'm going to um, to dive right in. Uh, and, and this, Ben and Bettina, will be for you guys. Um, so, so based on the fact that both of you talked about you've had an increase in the interest from the domestic market and travelers from the domestic market, um, do you have any insights into if these are new people to your destination? And if so, do you believe that you will have, you know, now gathered uh, a whole group of, um, of first timers that will become, you know, lifelong customers? I mean, I can start to answer this question. Okay. I mean, we, of course, we got a really, a lot of new customers, especially Swiss, um, of course, Swiss customer and they said they, they, they really were happy here as well. And they said they really want to come back and um, come skiing in winter. So as they had a nice summer holiday here, but still Swiss people, they love to travel and they, they go away a lot. And 
I'm not 100% sure. I think it's they, they were stayed in their country because they had to and it was so dynamic and they didn't know where they can go or if they have to quarantine when they come back. So I think maybe a little bit of new customers we would have got, but I think when when the borders are open again, I think the Swiss people, they, they're going to go away again. <laughs> Fair enough. I, I think in Whistler, we've, we've, we've certainly attracted a, a few new people and it'll be interesting to see whether their experience here this summer um, will in, you know, like influence their decisions about traveling within BC in the future. But as well, I think, uh, I think when the, the borders reopen, I think everybody is going to want to go somewhere else um, and then it might settle back down again in a, in a year or two. Yeah. So you're, so you're not currently planning any sort of marketing strategies that are specific to, you know, the, those newcomers, those local newcomers. We have a, a, a local residence rate um, and some return guest rates that we uh, try and encourage uh, people to, to repeat book. Um, and we to participate in, in, in most of the OTA programs to, uh, you know, offer incentives for the, the most frequent travelers and, and loyal guests, but um, that's about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I can agree with that, yes. Um, all right, thanks guys. So um, Ben, you had mentioned that your pools are open. Have you had to put any sorts of um, processes and procedures into place as far as signups or limiting, limiting you know, uh, capacity there? We, once again, in, in British Columbia, we, we tend to get advice and, and it's about being kind and encouraging and educating. Um, and we worry about this every day um, because uh, we have people on that pool deck who don't believe in COVID. And then we have some people on the pool deck who are extremely anxious. So their perception of how busy and how distant things are, are, are wide. We have signage, we have lots of extra cleaning we have uh, members of staff, uh, myself included, who will put the mask on and, and walk out every hour and do some education and encouragement. And we have some, we have some uh, approximate capacity guidelines. So we'll go around and really try and have a customer service touch point once an hour with every guest. And, and if it gets busy, we'll start to encourage people to, to share nicely and, uh, and keep their time on, on the pool deck to about an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, that's definitely a good point you made that everyone kind of has different, you know, feelings and tolerance for, for different situations. Um, so Ryan, I've got a question for you and maybe you've got some insights for us. We have obviously all seen that, you know, outdoor spaces and open spaces are really, um, you know, really popular now. Do you have any information on how that's increased and how that compares from past years as far as interest in, you know, mountain destinations and, and lakes, national parks and all of that? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't have a, a silver bullet piece of, of information, but what I can tell is, and I, I was actually taking some notes from some of the other panelists, you know, I think overall what we're seeing is historically people would take these European vacations, they would take vacations to not other countries, and, and really there's been a resurgence in the staycation, and the staycation is really in, in line with whatever restrictions you're currently experiencing wherever you live. So, you know, people are no longer interested in staying in quarantine in their city location. So going up from Vancouver, they, they visit Ben and, and Whistler. And we're seeing that as sort of a, a common theme anecdotally throughout, uh, throughout our, di our different markets in the globe. I'll say another interesting tidbit that came from my perspective as I was listening was hearing about how Ben and some of the other uh, panelists are changing the content that they offer. Uh, to make sure they're attracting the current types of guests coming in. And from my perspective, that's, that's key, right? Making sure you're taking photos of your pool space. Um, I loved what Bettina was saying about the business traveler, maybe not wanting to work in their home office anymore, so doing staycations and things like that. And I mean, at the end of the day, content is such a huge piece of our business that can be overlooked. And we're making sure that health and safety and photos and all of that is at the top of our uh, priority list as well. Mm -hmm. Good, great. So um, I, I'd like to also ask both Ben and Bettina, 
What do you think, um, what did you struggle with most as far as, you know, reopening goes? I see you thinking, Bettina. So <laughs> you an answer yeah. ready or? Is everything an answer? <laughs> <laughs> right, I know everything does seem like it's a struggle these days. I mean, I wouldn't say it was a big struggle, but I mean, to put all these uh, rules in place like we had this rule that you at the beginning that you have to have two meter distance in the restroom for example so we had to 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 relocate all the tables and chairs that we can make sure that there is this that we can keep the distance between the tables and also to to get to put all these rules in place and so I think this it was organizational, a, a big effort, like that we had to buy things uh, for the hotel and put them in place. So th this was, was a bit, little bit of struggle in the beginning, but then as soon as we had, had these investments done, uh, we were fine. That, that, that was my feeling. I, I think for us, our, 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 probably our biggest challenge was um, understanding the capacity and then being able to plan and adapt for it in terms of, of our staffing levels. Um, that's been really hard as we ramp up or have quiet days midweek and it's, and it's, and it's not the usual pattern. It was like Lance saying with uh, his, his chef who always knew to order more steaks in July where all of that is out of the window. Um, so just trying to be as flexible as we can be um, with, with capacity staffing, housekeeping is a, is, has been a challenge for us for sure. And, and having enough people on the, on the front desk so that we don't get those lineups, which, you know, increase the, the challenges of distancing. So how, how have you, you just mentioned um, staff and how have you managed to educate staff on, you know, new procedures, new protocols, and, um, you know, it, customer interactions, uh, uh, what's that whole process been like and how has the staff received um, all of that, you know, new training? We, uh, we had a, 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 a GM, a general manager led session with all staff um, when we reopened the hotel, which was really useful and, and set the scene. And then it's been one-on-one -on -one training um, with individual members and um, we have some some company standards about uh, face coverings and mask wearing in public areas. Um, and then uh, probably at the end of June, we had a, a staff feedback, a team feedback session. And that was actually really useful um, to hear if our, if our team thought that we were protecting ourselves and our guests well, and, and we made some changes after that um, and tightened things up a little bit because uh, uh, we had some, we had some feedback that if we, we presented ourselves a little bit uh, uh, stricter than that would probably be reciprocated by the guests. So I think the guests take a lot of um, feedback from the staff once they walk into a hotel. And, and certainly in Whistler, it's, it's, it's been a challenge where people think that, that they go on vacation and, and COVID doesn't come with them. Um, and, and we've been, as a community, really trying to re remind people that, that you're just as likely to catch COVID, you know, in Whistler as in anywhere else in the world. Yeah, very true. Bettina? Any yeah, same for us. I mean, at the, at the beginning, of course, I, I did the education with the, the managers of every property and then especially like for the, the different um, parts, like say the kitchen and the service and the housekeeping, especially the housekeeping. We really did one-on-one -on -one training for a full week. We, we actually went with them, showed them that they need to disinfect things like hourly, like being with them whole time in control and, and, and just myself or especially also my mom who was still in the business. She was just running around with the housekeeping for a full week and trained them how to, to, to clean things differently now or which products to use and what they have to adapt newly every morning. So, but then they made also themselves like kind of a list what they have to do and what's new and what they have to look at. And then they ticked, they take this, these things off. I mean, it was new for us as well. So we had to educate ourselves first a little bit and understand everything. But, but now I think it works very well, but it's still important. Like 
as also Ben said, to remind the people, also to remind people that this call that these guests and it, it, there can be guests that are having the virus and like that, that they don't like with time that they start to ignore things and so on like to to remind them all the time to keep up with these special restrictions special rules and what they have to do so we have to re to keep on reminding them that this virus is just not disappearing at the moment mm -hmm. so um Switching gears a little bit, we've got a question about group bookings and, you know, a, a lot of destinations and um, areas are limiting numbers of, uh, you know, how big a group can be, it has to be from the same household and, and all of that. Um, are your properties putting in, in place any sort of restrictions or have you seen any group bookings or, or are you allowing group bookings, you know, up to a certain size and um, what does that look like? Yeah, our, group is, oh. Sorry, our, our group business um, wasn't very big and it's pretty much non-existent now. So that's, that's fallen off to a, a back burner kind of uh, thought process, at least until next year. Yeah. So for, for me, it's like, I have now my first group arriving in September and what, so this was kind of like, our first group being back, like it's a one week group. So they stay a little bit longer. And I'm what we have knew now that we were in really um, close contact with the operator and we talk to each other what, what they think, what they request. So usually when we have groups, for example, we sit them together at big tables and now we have separate tables for example for 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 the groups that the people in the same room for example have their own table so we kind of like we discuss with the operator how we can implement the rules together and work together and and also ask them if they have special requirements and so on but we will see how this goes we, switzerland has no restrictions with groups at the moment so this is not a problem but still we have to look with the operator because we want to assure that also the clients in the group are happy and 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 protect them so we we talk a lot with each other yeah and i'm just curious what's the size of that group how large is that your first group so we don't have big groups because we're just too small to have uh, big groups but it's it's around 25 people I think anybody would be happy with a, a group booking of that size. Well, it's my first one and I'm not sure if it's going to happen. I mean, I'm flexible. I told them that they can cancel this booking up to, to one week ahead. So, and we stay in contact. They, it's not filled yet, all the places. So let's see if it's really happening. It won't be the first group this summer. We're definitely all uh, crossing our fingers for you, Tina. So uh, Ryan, do you have any insights into that with, a, um, you know, with what Expedia is seeing, any sort of larger groups booking? Um, yeah, so we don't, we don't have sort of like the, the crystal ball for group business, um, you know, but hearing some of the partner sentiments on, on this panel, you know, I think largely in line where we've been focusing from our travelers and, and travelers coming into the different properties right now is, more than like three fourths of uh, customers are citing cleanliness as one of like the main factors when making a decision right now. So whether it's an individual traveler or a group traveler, any way you can cite some of that content and being up to date on that content, especially as it relates to whatever local restrictions you have is really, really important. So, you know, that translates to both how group business and individual traveler business uh, is going to be impacted as we move through this together. But that's definitely something we're seeing. And with any group, it's a, a big concern right now as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. I, I, I think that, you know, everyone's priorities have changed, but um, that cleanliness standards are really at the top. And, um, you know, it seems like you're both have great, um, procedures in place and uh, that you're, you're really embracing that. So we are uh, just about at time and I wanna make sure that we let our audience go on time. So I will say thank you 
to uh, Ryan, Bettina, Ben, and um, I, I hope our audience saw in the chat that Lance had to drop off a little bit early so he wasn't able to join us for the Q&A. But we thank all of you for being here with us today and uh, sharing your insights um, on uh, our current situation and, and what it looks like for lodging properties. So thank you guys so much. And uh, we will see the MTS audience next time around. Thank you. Cool. Thank Thanks you. all. Have a nice Bye, day. Everybody. Bye.